half of what he said about him is true. The man we're going to be talking about today is one of those rare individuals for whom the phrase larger than life seems to have been created. The subject of this multi-part series is 19th century Lakota leader Crazy Horse. His life was characterized by a degree of heroism and bravery at a level much deeper than the majority of human beings can even imagine. But by the same token, his life was also characterized by a degree of tragedy, running much deeper than the majority of human beings can even imagine. It has entered our common vocabulary to use the term Greek tragedy to describe something that's equally epic and tragic. Well, the story we'll play with today very much fits the bill, but there's nothing Greek about it. This is a Lakota tragedy through and through. Crazy Horse was pretty much the embodiment of the strong, silent type. He was an introvert, no doubt about it, but he was also ridiculously powerful as a warrior. Now, Lakota culture in the 19th century, there are a few things that stand out about it. Among them, the fact that most men, there was a certain degree of machismo that characterized the culture. A lot of the men were big on celebrating their own achievements. You know, warriors were usually pretty vocal about thumping their chests, letting everybody know how bad they were. So in some way, it was easy to overlook a guy like Crazy Horse, who was very much the opposite of this uh, Lakota stereotype. He was quite soft-spoken, did not indulge in the kind of flamboyant decorations popular among his peers. Nobody ever heard him boast about his achievement. So it was easy to forget about him in a way, except for the fact that once they left camp and warriors went on the warpath, the seemingly mellow individual would shapeshift into the incarnation of warrior Führer. According to all accounts, the man was completely fearless. The stories about him abound regarding him charging his horse in the midst of dozens of enemies in order to rescue a wounded friend. Yes, he did speak softly, but his actions definitely spoke for him. Among the tribes of the Great Plains, there was a tradition known as counting coup. What that meant, think of it as a way for warriors to keep track of their statistics, so to speak. You know, the same way if you follow basketball, you know, players by their numbers, you know, how many three-pointers they scored, how many rebounds, how many assists, that kind of thing. Counting coup, a coup was uh, any time you did something very brave, something that you would gain recognition for, that was recognized as having counted a coup. And typically things like, for example, even things that did not have a seemingly practical result, for example, touching an enemy in battle would allow you to count coup. Why touching an enemy? Why not just killing him? Well, killing him, you could be 200 yards away and shoot him. And yes, that would say something about your accuracy, but it would say nothing about your bravery. Whereas if you were within touching distance from an enemy, that meant that you were a seriously brave man, that you were face to face with the enemy in the midst of battle. So that was one of the ways in which you would count coup. You could count coup by taking horses away from an enemy's tribes, you know, sneaking into their camp, stealing them and getting out. You know, there are a variety of ways of counting coup, but each one of them basically represented some kind of brave deed. Well, the story about Crazy Horse is that throughout his career he counted more than 200 coups, which was a record completely unmatched by even the greatest warriors of his era. All of the Red Cloud, Spotted Tail, Sitting Bull, many of the other renowned Lakota leaders, none of them even came close. His reputation was for being both super brave and super generous. He played a key role, as we're going to see, in two of the biggest defeats by the U.S. Army during the wars in the plains. He very much remains to this day as a symbol of resistance for the Lakota people. 
particularly in his struggle to hold on to the Black Hills, which were Lakota sacred land. In the history of the Lakota people in specific, and American Indian people in general, it would be tough to find a guy who's more revered as a hero, who's more revered as the pretty much embodying the archetype of what a warrior is supposed to be all about. Part of his appeal is the fact that he regularly refused to get entangled in political dealings. You know, to this day, we, most people hate politicians because we see how often the political game is designed to be about compromising your ideals constantly in order to get something done. You know, the entire political game is based on compromise. So while that may be needed or it may be practically important, it's not exactly the most romantic thing in the world to do. We like our heroes to be uncompromising when it comes to their principles. And Crazy Horse very much fits the bill. He avoided most political meetings, not just in his interaction with white Americans, but even with his own people. He was first and foremost a man of action. He was not a man of committees. He had very little interest in politics. He usually stayed away from most discussions, from political meetings, from councils. He kind of liked to be left alone. He was somewhat of a solitary man. Here are some of the words that Lakota people themselves have used to describe Crazy Horse. Lucille's runs after was the great-granddaughter of Lone Horn, who was one of Crazy Horse kinsmen, said, I quote, My mother and aunts all said that Crazy Horse was an outstanding person. There was something magic about him. He made people happy by his presence. Then we have Nicholas Black Elk, who's the subject of the famous book Black Elk Speaks. He very simply stated, but very simply but very powerfully stated, Crazy Horse was the greatest chief of all. And Guy Dull Knife, who's an important character in this amazing book about Lakota culture called The Dull Knives of Pine Ridge, Guy Dull Knife stated, My grandfather told my father that Crazy Horse always rode at the head of the war party, that he always rode out front, and took the first volley of shots. This way, the warriors riding behind him could take good aim while the enemy was reloading. He was a very modest man, a humble chief, not the show of kind like some of the others. He was a great man, our greatest chief. More than anything, he loved his people and his homeland. But while, as all these quotes clearly indicate, he was undoubtedly an amazing human being, and people, you know, to this day, Lakota people have tremendous respect for him, pretty much all reports also state that he was, how can I put it, a strange man, a weird human being. Which in some way shouldn't surprise us, since you don't really get to be a legend by being normal. And Crazy Horse very much proves this point. Black Elk, again turning to some of the primary sources, Black Elk reports that Crazy Horse would often invite him when, when Black Elk was a little kid. Crazy Horse, who was already an adult at the time, would invite him to his stand and would um, try to chat with him, try to you know, make him feel... He was, they were relatives and he would try to kind of make him feel at home. But Black Elk reports how he would not speak, he felt kind of scared around Crazy Horse. Here is Black Elk's own words. I was not afraid that he would hurt me. I was just afraid. Everybody felt that way about him, for he was a weird man, and would go about the village without noticing people or saying anything. In his own teepee he would joke, and when he was on the warpath with a small party, he would joke to make his warriors feel good. But around the village, he hardly ever noticed anybody, except little children. All the Lakotas like to dance and sing, but he never joined the dance, and they say nobody ever heard him sing. But everybody liked him, 
and they would do anything he wanted or go anywhere he said. He was a small man among the Lakotas, and he was slender and had a thin face, and his eyes looked through things, and he always seemed to be thinking hard about something. He never wanted to have many things for himself, and did not have many ponies, like a chief. They say when game was scarce, and the people were hungry, he would not eat at all. He was a strange man. By the way, just so you know, I have uh, slightly changed one of the words that Black Elk uses, because... Black Elk Speaks was uh, written in the 1930s, and it was a, anyway a translation from Lakota. You know, Black Elk didn't speak any of these words. These, he spoke in Lakota, and these words were translated into English. And I'm adapted the English a little bit to modern language, because the word that Black Elk here used was, uh, he said he was a queer man. But, you know, in today's vocabulary, queer tend to have an uh, association with homosexuality, which is really not what Black Elk is alluding to. He's talking about somebody strange, somebody weird. I've used those words instead, just so you know. And along making the same point, Guidel Knife writes, a lot of the time he was seen in the evenings sitting up in the hills or at the edge of camp. He was almost always by himself. So here we have this image of this guy who doesn't speak much, who minds his own business a lot of the time, who's often this lonely figure in this tribal community, and yet this very powerful figure, this very intense, charismatic figure in his own odd kind of way. But the other aspect of the story, you know, I've alluded to his power, to the heroism, to the bravery, all of that, but the other side of the story is that all of his powers didn't really shield him from heartbreaking losses throughout his life. Great power and charisma in his life went hand in hand with incredible pain. Here is the point of the podcast where we run into the obligatory Game of Thrones reference. There's a line in Game of Thrones that very much applies to Crazy Horse. The line goes like this. What good is power if you cannot protect the ones you love? Well, that in a nutshell is the story of Crazy Horse's life. Crazy Horse will see nearly everyone who was ever close to him die in front of him. Multiple relatives, starting in his childhood and continuing throughout his whole life. Many of his friends. Everybody, really. Even his way of life, he's gonna see, he's gonna see it die before his eyes. Kingsley Bray, who is the author of an excellent biography about Crazy Horse, wrote, I quote, Profoundly scarred by personal tragedy and loss, his personality was marked by melancholy and reticence. And the way that Crazy Horse dealt with the unbelievable amount of pain that destiny will dish out his way was to silence the pain in orgies of blood, specifically the blood of his many enemies. There are a few more things that I want to touch on before starting the narration of his life story. First, I should address the sources. You know, how reliable is the information we have about him? What kind of sources are out there? And the reality, like often it's the case in history, is that our sources are spotty at best. Uh, studying Crazy Horse life means dealing with a lot of speculation. You know, only for the last four months of his life, he was in regular contact with white Americans who wrote down uh, their impressions of him and more details about what happened. For all of his earlier life, we have to rely on a Lakota oral tradition that was Taken down, you know, there was a lady in the early 1900s named Mary Sandals who took down, she, you know, she went to interview some of the old timers who were still alive, who had met Crazy Horse when he was, when he was alive. And, you know, she interviewed some of these people in the early 1930s. But the reality is that she only had a few pages of notes. And yet she ended up writing an extremely long book. There are disagreements about 
Mary Sanders' books. I mean, Mary Sanders remains, you know, her book was the primary biography of Crazy Horse for an extremely long time. On one end, she did an amazing research job. You know, we would probably not know half of what we know about Crazy Horse if it wasn't for Sanders. But at the same time, her book was not really history, it was not a biography in a classical sense. She took a lot of history and then started mixing fact with fiction to end up creating an amazing historical fiction that's mostly biographical, but she took quite a few liberties with the details of Crazy Horse Life. You know, the evidence now seems to indicate that she played with the chronology for dramatic purposes, often oversimplified some issues. Most biographies of Crazy Horse today repeat the same story that Sanders told. You know, they basically shamelessly paraphrase Sanders and just publish new books, which is really not the most honest thing you could possibly do. There are a couple of works, however, that stand out in the sense that they provide other sources. They dug up, you know, there's a DVD series by some members of Crazy Horse family that they put together, that they report some of the traditions uh, that were passed on in, within their family. Now, whether this is all accurate or not is anybody's guess, but at least there's some interesting primary evidence there. There's also an author that I mentioned earlier, this guy by the name of Kingsley Bray, who uh, did an excellent job digging up all the primary sources and try to compile them together in a biography of Crazy Horse. Now, his work is considerably less readable than Mary Sanders. Mary Sanders reads uh, like a beautiful novel, because it is, but in some ways more historical, if not always more readable. The reality at the end of the day is that there's not a ton of reliable information for good parts of Crazy Horse's life. Sometimes this will be frustrating, since I'll keep reminding you that what I'm telling you is one version of the story, but there may be others who disagree. And this will be particularly evident in the early part of the story, in the next probably hour or so, when the evidence available is really thin. Part of the mystery of his life goes so far that we don't even really know what he looked like. Now, if you look at most American Indian leaders from the late 1800s, there are multiple photographs for every one of them. You know, you name Red Cloud, Geronimo, Sitting Bull, you know, all of those guys you can see. If you just Google their names, immediately you're going to run into a lot of pictures of them. There's not a single available picture of Crazy Horse. There are many that have been suggested as being Crazy Horse, but none of them have been confirmed. Uh, the story goes that Crazy Horse consistently refused having any American take his picture. So all we have are description of what the man looked like. All of them hint that he was of average height and weight. Lakota people tend to be fairly big guys, you know, especially the men, they were pretty big guys. He was on the lighter end of the spectrum. Um, depending on who you listen to, he was probably somewhere between 5'6 and 5'10 tall, fairly thin. He had long, wavy brown hair they reach all the way down his waist. Often they were wrapped up in two braids. And contrary to most Lakota people, both his hair color and his skin color, he was a few shades lighter than normal. As a Lakota man by the name of Short Bull stated, his features were not like the rest of us. Also the description regarding his behavior is that his eyes hardly ever look straight at someone, but somehow he managed never to miss anything of what was going on around him. It's almost as if he was constantly scanning his environment 360 degrees all around him. A journalist that met, who met him in 1877 said that his eyes were, I quote, exceedingly restless, and they impressed the beholder fully, as much as does his general demeanor. What we're going to do today is not exactly a biography of Crazy Horse. I mean, yes, we will go through Crazy Horse life. That in some way is the subject of our story. But it's also more than that. We're also going to 
look at the story of the Lakota people in their conflict with the United States between the 1850s and the 1870s. And in particular, this first episode of the story will contain a lot of material that's more about the greater context than just about Crazy Horses himself. One quick note as we get going regarding vocabulary. You'll probably hear me switch back and forth between using words such as Indian, American Indian, Native American, indigenous people, First Nations, you know, there are three gazillion words that are used to refer to the people who inhabited this continent before Europeans showed up. The reality is that they are all made up, you know, before contact with Europeans, and even often long after contact with Europeans, nobody would ever say that I'm Indian or I'm Native American or I'm a First Nation. You know, people identified with their specific tribal nation. All of these terms came up later as generalizations, as to indicate somebody who was not European who was originally from this continent. And as such, they are all a little less than fully precise. You know, if you look at the most common of them, the, the word Indian is obviously not very precise because it comes A, from a geographical mistake when Columbus ended up in the wrong continent but decided to use the word Indian. B, it implies this common identity among people from tribes that are completely different culturally, linguistically, religiously, on every possible level. But, you know, once we're aware of that, the word Indian is as good as any as a generalization. Ideally, I'm going to try to stay away as much as possible from generalizing, but when uh, the time will come, you'll hear me use these words pretty much interchangeably. You know, some people don't like the word Indian. They think there's something racist about it. I tend to disagree. You know, just about all native people I've ever met never had a problem with the word Indian. That tended to be the one that they used the most. You know, I do see the problem with words that are obvious put-downs, that have a negative value judgment associated with them. You know, speaking of people as savages or something like that. Yeah, that is a racist concept. But the word Indian is just not the most precise thing in the world, that's about it. Now, having said that, one more thing. A lot of what is written about Native Americans is heavily stereotypical. And usually the stereotypes go either one of two ways. Either the history is written to the lenses of an idealized portrayal of Native Americans as amazing, perfect, wonderful environmentalists can do no wrong, or they are written through the lenses of an extremely racist worldview. And most of the books that are out there tend to fall in one camp or another. It's very hard to find anything that's more nuanced in that regard, that addresses Native American as real flesh and blood human beings who would uh, screw up and do horrible things just as any other human being on Earth, without automatically upping the ant and pushing it in a more racist interpretation of it. I'll try to stay away from both of these extremes since they are since they equally miss the point, but that's just a note of warning regarding what's out there. And since we're speaking of terminology, you have heard me already refer to Crazy Horses people as the Lakota. And while this is true, it gets more complicated than that because you have the 
general term that they use for themselves, in this case Lakota, which also, depending on the dialect, you could hear it pronounced Dakota or Nakota. To make things more complicated, the western subdivision of these tribes were divided up in seven bands, each one with a different name. Crazy Horse specifically belonged to the Oglala Lakota. And on top of it, you also have the terms that are applied to these people, not by themselves, but by outsiders. For example, in much of the literature, the Lakota people are referred to as the Sioux. The term Sioux was originally a term that came from some of their tribal enemy, from the Ojibwa, who used the word Nadowesu, which I hear it translated as little snakes, which was obviously not a compliment, it was a put down. And then white Americans served it, chopped it down to Sioux, and that's the name that they used to refer to them. So, you know, crazy horse people, you can see them referred to as Lakota, as uh, Sioux, more specifically the tribe that he belonged to were the Oglala. Even among the Oglala, there were subdivisions, so it can get, it can become easy to get lost in it. I'm going to try to guide you along in a way that doesn't get too confusing. So let's say something about the Lakota people and their culture. By the time we have the first reports from Europeans, usually French fur traders, regarding the Lakota, maybe in the 1600s or so, the Lakota lived in the woodlands of, in the eastern portion of North America, often lived in the forests of Minnesota, possibly even as far east as Wisconsin. They were at war with other native tribes, such as the Cree and the Ojibwa. In the co course of the conflict with these tribes, they ended up getting pushed west. Both the Ojibwa and the Cree were better armed than the Lakota, since they had better connection to the French traders who sold them guns. So, over a period of time, they started pushing the Lakota westward. This was happening probably in the early 1700s, at the same time when horses coming from the south were being traded to the northern tribes. So, so the Lakotas found themselves migrating out of the woodlands into the Great Plains of North America and running into horses at this time. They quickly adopted the horse as a big element in their culture and they completely changed their culture. If prior to this time they used to be, yeah, they did some hunting and gathering, but they were also farmers to one some degree, they did some planting. Once they acquired horses, they largely gave up the farming practices and they reinvented themselves as full-time nomadic buffalo hunters. If you have watched any Hollywood movies about American Indians, that's usually what you get. Often the stereotype is that all American Indians live by hunting buffaloes, living in teepees and all that kind of stuff. And it's obvious why that's the stereotype, is because that's out of all the lifestyles that American Indians engaged in at the time of contact with Euro-Americans, that's certainly the most striking, visually and in just about every other way. But the reality is that that lifestyle was a product of Euro-American colonization. Most, first the horse, you know, there were no horses in North America before contact with Europeans. Or rather, there were many thousands of years ago, but they went extinct and they were never domesticated. So the horse is one thing that will become part of native cultures only after contact with Europeans. And in the case of the Lakota, the finding themselves on the Great Plains, that's not where they used to be a hundred years before, two hundred years before. You know, by the time they get there in the mid to late 1700s, it's a result of the United States, or rather it's not yet the United States, by this point in the early 1700s, you're talking still about European colonization. As European colonization is pushing west, and in turn they push other tribes west, and this tribe will push other tribes west, the Lakota find themselves on the Great Plains when the horses become available and they engage in this lifestyle. But the whole nomadic buffalo hunting on horseback, living in teepees kind of lifestyle 
really only existed between the 1700s and the late 1800s. And in many ways it's obvious to see why this lifestyle captures the imagination of so many people. It's because in a lot of ways this is a great lifestyle. It has all the advantages of being a hunter and gatherer without all the problems that go with being a hunter and gatherer. You know, one of the problems of hunting and gathering lifestyle is that you are forced to live in these very small tribes, usually 10 to 50 individuals, because you need to spread out in order to be able to tap in the available resources. Well, horses change all that. The fact that thanks to horses you can be able to have access to so many more resources than hunters and gatherers who live on foot do, means that the lifestyle that the Lakota and other tribes will engage in, you know, yes, they are kind of hunters and gatherers, but think of them as hunters and gatherers on steroids. You know, they do everything the hunters and gatherers do, but on a much larger scale. Their villages were often anywhere between 150 to 400 people living together, but it was not at all uncommon for many, many more to come together, sometimes camps including thousands of people who would live together for at least part of the year. And all of this was made possible thanks to the horse. And another feature of their life is that more often than not, they were engaged in intertribal warfare with rival tribes, both with some of the farming tribes that inhabited the Great Plains, tribes like the Hidatsa, Harikara, Mandan, Pony, Omaha, a whole bunch of others, as well as with other buffalo hunting ones, Crow, Shoshone, Blackfeet, you name it. I could go on, but I don't want to turn this into an anthropological podcast describing just Lakota lifestyles. I want to get back to Crazy Horse, so I'll cut it short for here, since I feel that I've given you at least a decent idea of what uh, Lakota life entailed. So let's get back to Crazy Horse. Crazy Horse, according to most sources, was probably born in 1840. He was born in the spring of 1840, somewhere in the western portion of South Dakota. Some people say where roughly where modern-day Rapid City is at. Some people say uh, even closer to the Black Hills. Some pe- you know, there are slight differences there, but basically the western portion of South Dakota. His father was named Crazy Horse, and he was a medicine man. When, when he was born, the guy we are referring to as Crazy Horse was not named Crazy Horse. As I said, his father was. He was actually named... Uh, native names, native naming traditions have some curious features. For example, usually when you are born, you get a baby name, meaning it's a name that is really only like a childhood name. It's often a nickname. They will stick around for a little bit until something very meaningful happens in your life. And then you acquire an adult name. And there's usually a story about your adult name. It's either it embodies some characteristics that your parents wish you have, or they may refer to some dream or vision you may have had, or they refer to some, you know, there's usually some kind of a tale surrounding native names. But when you're first born, you get like a childhood name that will stick around for a while until eventually you get an adult name. So Crazy Horse, when he was born, was not Crazy Horse. His father was. The R Crazy Horse was nicknamed Curly or Curly Hair because his hair was unusually wavy for a Lakota. Tragedy first visited Crazy Horse life, or rather, we can still refer to him as Carly's life, when he was four years old. There's one story that's only reported in the Kingsley Bray biography, but it's an interesting one. This is not the main tragedy that I'm referring to, but it's an interesting one nonetheless. Story goes that he had an uncle on his father's side by the name of Milkrow, who was a great warrior. And he, as well as Curly's father, the elder Crazy Horse, led over 160 men on a raid to steal horses from the Shoshone tribe. 
they marched on foot, they managed to kill a Shoshone scout, but another one ran away and was able to warn the rest of the tribe that this group of Lakota were there trying to steal their horses. Snow had begun to fall, making it harder to try to uh, run fast in the snow. And, you know, the, the odds were it's probably a good time to abort. It's probably a good time to abandon this raid, turn around and make a run for it before the Shoshone can catch up. But some of them had kind of taunted Mail Crow to keep going, to lead the attack. Uh, Mail Crow apparently had replied, I am a man to look for death, and decided to push forward, which turned out not to be such a great idea since hundreds of Shoshone warriors surrounded them and killed Mail Crow as well as 30 others. Crazy Horse the Helder kind of left his brother and instead took off and ran away, and the story is that he kind of carried survivor's guilt as a result of this for a long time afterwards. Again, keep in mind, this story only appears in one source. It's a good source, but other sources disagree with this, just so you know. But regardless, let's go to the big tragedy for when Curly was four years old. The details differ, but all sources agree on one point, that Crazy Horse's mother, whose name was Rattle Blanket Woman, was from the Minneconjo subdivision of the Lakota people. She died when he was four years old. She died the uh, not an easy or pleasant death either. She hanged herself from a cottonwood tree. Now, there are a couple of versions for why she did this. One story tells that her husband, Crazy Horse the Elder, was mad about... Curly's being light-skinned and then accused her of an affair with a white trader. That's one version of the story. Another version of the story, the one that's reported in the Crazy Horse Family DVD, tells us that Crazy Horse the Elder ran into a Lakota camp that was under attack, a different camp, and he noticed that they were under attack by members of the Crow tribe. So there was this big free-for-all, this big battle taking place. Crazy Old the Elder joined the battle and helped the Lakota defend themselves against this attack. Just keep in mind, when I say the Lakota, it's not like all of these Lakota people lived in one village. There were many, many separate villages that, you know, they all had the same culture, they all spoke the same language, but politically speaking, they were all independent. In any case, he helped members of this other village so one of the main leaders of the village decided to reward him by giving away two of his daughters to the elder Crazy Horse as wives. Uh, polygamy was very common and accepted in Lakota culture at the time. So Crazy Horse the Elder make his way back to his village with two new wives trailing along. And the story goes that Rattle Blanket Woman didn't take it so well and she may have decided to hang herself over this. Regardless of the reason, there was some kind of conflict between uh, Curly's mother and father that led to his mom hanging herself when Curly was only four years old. And Curly took it as bad as you may expect somebody to take it under the circumstances. The story goes for the next three years, between the time he was four and seven years old, he hardly spoke a word. He showed the classic signs of psychological regression. He would just not speak to anybody, be kind of lost in his own world. Um, he would just ride his horse. Because, you know, Lakota kids learn to ride their horse pretty much as soon as they learn how to walk. So it wasn't uncommon for a five-year-old to go off riding on his own. He would ride his, uh, his horse to be off by himself in the hills. He started already this pattern of seeking solitude, which will become one of the characteristics of his life. Now, he lived in a household with his father and his two new wives, uh, where, the, incidentally, these two wives were sisters. 
and they were also sister of an uh, important Lakota leader who will play a big role in Crazy Horse's life, a man by the name of Spotted Tail. Just keep the name in mind since we're going to talk about him later. So it's possible that he felt kind of excluded, somewhat out of the loop. Eventually, a couple of uh, his mom's sisters decided to join the household and move in to help uh, raise Curly to essentially act as surrogate moms for him. But regardless, his life, already by the time he was four years old, had taken a very dark, tragic turn. Once Crazy Horse, after a few years, began showing sign of normal development again, or showing some sign that maybe he didn't really get over, I don't know if he ever got over his mom's death, throughout his life, but at least he got better compared to how he was taking it for the first few years. His life, yes, he will be this kind of solitary, lonely guy, but he will also establish some important relationship, and I feel like I should mention some of them and the influence that they had on his life. There was a man that, according to some sources, was uh, his mom's brother, so he was an uncle, other people refer to him as some other kind of relative, but in either case, the sources refer to him as either high backbone or hump, which is basically the same thing. There are different translations of the same thing, referring to the hump, specifically the hump of the buffalo. Um, I may refer to him as hump or high backbone. I may go back and forth. He was very famous in Lakota camps for being a great hunter and a great warrior. He was this big, strong guy, probably about 6'3 or so in height, muscular, great warrior. And he, due to his renown, he could have picked any kid he wanted to groom into, you know, he could have made connections with influential families this way by grooming their kids, teaching them all he knew, sort of becoming their mentoring, becoming hunters and warriors. But instead, he surprised everyone when he chose to bestow his attention on Crazy Horse instead. Or again, I keep calling it Crazy Horse, still Curly at this time. He kind of took him under his wing and started teaching him everything he knew. Teaching him how to scout, how to locate game, how to be on the watch out for enemy attacks, how to guide tribal migrations how to, even things that to us may seem borderline supernatural, like how to be able to detect where water is just by tiny changes in the air currents. You know, some skills like tracking, you know, all the skills that if you live in close contact with nature, you need to pick up. But for people who don't grow up that way, it may seem like almost magical. Like, how do you know that this was happening? How could you tell that, well, you know, if you... If you guys know anybody who's any good at tracking, it seems magical sometime how they can look at the ground and know exactly what happened in that spot in the previous hours, what animal passed by, how, how many hours before and all of that. Well, multiply this time a hundred since the kind of knowledge that these people needed to have in order to survive back then was pretty well developed. And the result is that Crazy Horse ended up becoming a great warrior, a great hunter and a great scout, thanks to the teachings received by High Backbone. Now, this was not all fun and games. In many ways, growing up as a Lakota boy was not exactly a barrel of monkeys. You know, there's a tale that Crazy Horse the Elder forced Curly to uh, kill a turtle, and so far so good, but things get a little rough when he asks him to cut out the heart of the turtle, which for reasons I have no idea why, but apparently turtles have these strange habits that their heart will keep pumping even after they are dead for a while. So even after you take out the heart of the, tar uh, of the turtle, the heart is still pumping in, in your hands, literally. So, you know, Crazy Horse has end up taking out this turtle's heart that's still pumping blood, and what his father ordered him to do was to eat it raw. And the tale goes that that traumatized him quite a bit, which, yeah, I can see why that would. And why did he ask him? He was part of this idea of 
you need to toughen up. You need to, if you're going to survive as a Lakota male, you need to be tough as nails. And uh, that entails eating the raw, still beating heart of a turtle when you are a little kid. So next time you think you, you feel like whining about your childhood and you feel that you had a rough childhood, well, use Crazy Horse to console yourself. Things could have been worse. Among some of the other close relationships, the Crazy Horse will develop when he was still a kid. Where, well, there's a story about him having some issues at home. The relationship with his stepmoms, with his dad, wasn't always the smoothest, so he decided to leave home when he was still a young kid, and at least for a while go to live among some of his relatives in uh, Minneconjukam. But I mentioned earlier the Minneconj were another of the subdivision of the Lakota. There he met another boy by the name of Horn Chips, who was a little bit older than uh, Curly was. Uh, Horn Chips was about 15 at this time, and this was actually fairly common for Crazy Horse's friends to always be older than he was. Horn Chips' parents had died of diseases, and Horn Chips had taken it pretty badly and had tried to kill himself. But when he was about to kill himself, he heard a voice urging him instead not to kill himself, but to seek a vision instead. Now, vision questing, I'm, I'm going to talk about it in a little bit, exactly what that entails and what vision questing is all about, but suffice to say, Horn Chips decided not to kill himself, was still alive now when he was 15, met Crazy Horse, they hit it off famously, and decided to become honka to each other. What's honka? The honka ceremony was... Uh, Think of it as an adoption. Honka where becoming a honka to somebody was like becoming a brother to somebody, like a family member that you choose rather than one that you are born into. They, the people adopting each other in this way would go through this ceremony that basically established some uh, connection that was even stronger than uh, blood family. They had this mutual obligation toward each other to always have to help each other in all things, to protect one another in battle. If one of them was killed, the other one would have to avenge him. And if one of them died, the other one would take care of their families for as long as they were able. As a Lakota man by the name of John Fire Lame Deer stated in an excellent book called The Lame Deer Seeker of Vision, he stated, they had to be ready at all times to give their lives for each other. So this was pretty serious business. They had to stage a big giveaway as part of the ceremony. And giveaway would be like when you give away a lot of your property as gifts to some of the people attending the ceremony. And in this was a way also to heal wounds with his own family because his father and his stepmoms stepped up and decided to uh, bring a lot of gifts that then Curly could give away to some of the uh, the people attending the ceremony. So they kind of helped him, support. they supported him in this, they sort of sponsored the ceremony. So in this way, Curly was able to get, uh, uh, to become Honka with, the, um, with horn chips, as well as to mend the sinks with his own blood family. And another close relationship that he'll develop will be with a boy younger than him named Little Hawk. Little Hawk, according to most accounts, was a younger brother of Crazy Horse. Some people argue that maybe he wasn't a brother, was some other kind of close relative, but ended up growing up with him and living in the same household. So, you know, whether he was actually a blood brother or not, in some way it doesn't even matter that much. For all intents and purposes, he was like a brother to Curly. And Curly kind of did what uh, High Backbone had done with him. He sort of takes him under his wing, protects him, teaches him what he knows. And there's a tale that's really interesting about the two of them. In, in 1853, when uh, Curly was about 13 years old and Little Hawk was quite a few years younger, the two of them were out eating uh, wild cherries that they found uh, out in the prairie. 
and they realize that they have made a big mistake. They're out there by themselves, and they notice that they have disturbed a grizzly bear, which is usually not what you want to do. One of their horses had run off in fear of the grizzly, the other one was trying to run off, and Crazy Horse managed to catch it, but first he realized, you know, he had to act quickly, so the first thing he did was actually to uh, pick up his brother and put up Little Hawk up in a tree, like try to push him up on a cottonwood that really only had enough room for one person, and so Curly pushed this little brother up there so he would be safe. Then he ran up and managed to catch one of the two horses that were running away, calmed him down, and then hop on the horse as the grizzly was beginning to charge them. Rather than running away, Curly decided to charge straight toward the grizzly bear. So there's, they're almost playing this game of chicken of who gives up first. And as it turns out, the grizzly decided that maybe he sees something in Curly that he decided, eh, I'm going to let this one go. We'll, uh, and regardless of what went through the brain of the grizzly at this time, he turns around and walks away instead. So that's one of the stories that was told and repeated around the campfires, emphasizing kind of Curly's generous heart and bravery, and how he had been taking care of his little brother and all of that stuff. Now let's switch gears a little bit. We're still talking about Curly slash Crazy Horse, however you want to call him, but we also are going to be talking about the general context of his times and uh, what was going on around him. The 1840s were a time of incredibly fast change in Lakota life. What had happened was, between 1846 and 1848, the Mexican-American War led to the United States acquiring huge chunks of land in the West. The U.S. will gain Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, plus little bits of other pieces of land. And not only that, but right when they acquired California, gold was discovered in California, which created the 1849 gold rush, very, very famous, that attracted thousands of people from other parts of the United States to California. What does this have to do with the Lakota who are in the middle of the Great Plains? Well, it has to do that many people from other parts of the States would want to travel through the Great Plains to get to California. So this put the Lakota people in much closer contact with white Americans than they had ever been before. Initially, the contacts were somewhat friendly. The Lakota sort of let American settlers travel through. In exchange, usually settlers would give away some little gifts, blankets, coffee, things like that, that the Lakota basically saw it as, you know, these guys are paying a toll to get through, we are nice to them, everything is working out. Well, initially things seemed to be working out between the Lakota and the United States, but not for very long, because one of the problems is that the numbers of settlers traveling through their land keeps increasing every year. And why is that a problem? Because for multiple reasons. For one, the cows that the settlers were taking with them ended up passing several diseases to the bison that the Lakota relied on. So there were less bison. You know, the bison started dying off as a result of this. Now, we're still talking about millions of them roaming the plains, but their numbers started dipping a little bit. Not only that, but... The cows also ate a lot of the grass that the bison relied on. So the bison ended up changing their migratory patterns as a result of the fact that they did not find food where they were used to finding it. So that forces the Lakota to follow the buffalo herds in completely different lands than what they were used to. And this is going to lead to increase intertribal warfare with tribes like the Crows, the Shoshone, the Pony, who also were trailing the bison herds. And the fact that, you know, there were less bison, plus they were moving in unusual migratory patterns, led to more intertribal warfare. 
add to this the fact that you know settlers traveling through would use a lot of the firewood that they found which you know firewood on the great plains was kind of scarce to begin with so that's something that really upset the lakota quite a bit add to this the fact that uh, they brought diseases with them that many native american people were had not been exposed to previously so some of these diseases were passed along clearly unintentionally but the end result was still that many Lakota, as well as many people from other tribes, were affected by these diseases in dramatic fashion. In Crazy Horse's own family, uh, he ended up seeing, shortly after 1849, when the numbers of uh, settlers increased dramatically, Crazy Horse ended up seeing four of his stepsisters, all of them under the age of five, die from a co cholera epidemic. So again, go back to his life. When he was about four or five years old, he saw his mom dying by hanging herself from a tree. He now see, by the time he's nine or ten years old, he sees four of his sisters die due to cholera, which is really not a nice way to go at all. You know, death was all around him, basically, which will probably explain some of his issues. In any case, away from Crazy Horse and back to the general context. In 1851, the United States organizes the biggest council that they have ever tried to set up with tribes across the Great Plains. Through diplomacy and gift-giving, the government managed to attract the biggest gathering of plain tribes in history. Tens of thousands of people will gather together at, for, at a place that will eventually become Fort Laramie, around the, the area of modern-day Wyoming. And, you know, this was a tense affair since there were many enemy tribes that gathered there. There was the potential for violence always was ready to blow up, but they do manage to stay at peace for a while. And essentially, why is the government doing all this? They want to make them a deal. They say, look, we're going to give you a good chunk of supplies in exchange for you letting settlers travel through the Great Plains unmolested. And while you are at it, we would like you to stop fighting each other. Why would I want native tribes to stop fighting each other? I mean, it makes sense. It would be great if they kill each other so they can have the land, right? Well, the idea was, it goes back to this notion of wanting the settlers to travel through unmolested. If uh, all these tribes say, sure, we won't bother them, but they are busy killing each other and raiding each other, it would be easy for the settlers to be caught in the crossfire. So this request for intertribal peace was uh, really to guarantee the safety of American travelers through these lands. And, you know, this one, this one is not going to work. You know, the tribes are not going to stop fighting each other. There's intertribal warfare is too much part of their life for them to give it up. And the other thing that the government requires is that they want each tribe to nominate one chief to be the big guy, the chief that they can uh, turn to so that a tribe will speak with just a single voice and they don't have to constantly convince dozens of different leaders. This is completely foreign to the culture of the Great Plains. You know, all the tribes there are not used to this kind of political hierarchy with one guy at the top. You know, this was really an effort that the US was making of trying to model them in their own image. But it doesn't work. You know, most of the guys that they want to nominate don't want to become the big leaders. They eventually kind of force a Lakota leader by the name of it's either translated as conquering bear or scattering bear as the big guy, but it's kind of a joke because most Lakota don't recognize him as such. So it's, uh, it's, it will create some political tensions within the Lakota tribes. But in any case, this 1851 treaty is signed. Everybody goes home happy. You know, the natives who have the promise that they will be given all these supplies the United States has the promise that American travelers will be able to travel through unmolested. And everybody calls it a win, and that's the end of that day. Well, the problem with this seemingly ideal scenario 
is that what the government says and what the government does, back then, as well as in many cases to this day, those two things are not one and the same. You know, the promises that the government had made, it turns out they're a lot easier to make than they are to keep. In the years after 1851, again and again, the, the promised supplies will either not get there, or a lot less than what's promised arrives there, or they get there very, very late. You know, there are problems, in other words, with, uh, with fulfilling this delivery. And this is happening as more settlers are pouring in, disrupting the buffalo herds even further, taking more firewood, spreading more diseases. So most of the plain tribes are really edgy. They feel like, you know, our life is taking a nosedive here. You know, the quality of our lifestyle is getting worse and worse. On top of it, the stuff you promised us is not really getting here on time. We are really not too happy about it. So this sets the stage for trouble to come. By 1853, some Lakotas are beginning to harass the settlers. Sometimes they take things from them, you know, it begins to borderline theft as they kind of intimidate them into giving more things in exchange for letting them go through. In one particular instance, close to Fort Laramie in, um, in Wyoming, What's going to happen, a group of Lakota warriors decide to go joyriding, stealing the boat that was used by migrants to cross a big river there. The soldiers told them, don't do that again. This boat is for us. You're not allowed to take it. But a few hours later, some other Lakotas decided to do the same thing. They take the boat, go joyriding down the river. Eventually, they bring the boat back. But, you know, the second time when it happens, some of the soldiers try to take the boat back by force. And this is where a Lakota decided to pick up his rifle and took a shot, barely missing the soldiers. So later that afternoon, a lieutenant by the name of Hugh Fleming decided to lead a group of soldiers toward a Lakota camp to take some prisoners over this incident. Now, the guy who had fired the shot wasn't there, and the majority of the men were out hunting at this time. So Fleming initially decided to capture the whole village. But he realized that was not going to be easy. Conflicts are breaking out. Some of the natives start going for their guns. So a shootout breaks out in which three Lakota are killed and two are captured. One of the old Lakota leaders, a guy by the name of Old Man Afraid, convinces them not to retaliate and not to attack the soldiers. But some of them are upset and decide instead to attack a group of settlers who are traveling by wagons just a few miles away. You know, bad blood is beginning to be created here. And to make things even worse, the government agent by the fort arrive with a message, really at the, with the worst possible timing, when... Tension is already building up between Lakota and uh, soldiers. Blood has been spilled. The new agent arrived with the message that the supplies will be dramatically reduced compared to what was promised in 1851. They are going to get a lot less than them, less than one third. So by now, if you are guessing that the Lakota may be angry, you are absolutely right. By the following year, in 1854, things are about to get worse. And this story I'm about to tell you is actually really important in the history of the Lakota-US conflict, because it will mark the first instance of open warfare between the US Army and the Lakota people. It happens in August 1854, and there will be the opening bell of a really long fight. The conflict between the Lakota and the U.S. will continue, not constantly, kind of back and forth. They will take breaks, but it will continue for well over 20 years. In its most intense form, it will go from 1854 to 1877. And then there will be a few events even afterwards, showing that the continuum is not really fully over until 1890. So this is the very first 
story of how the conflict began. Well, the conflict begins with the supplies that have been promised to the Lakota are late as usual, and the Lakota are growing angrier by the minute. In this context, there's a group of Mormons traveling west who are letting their cows roam a little too far and eventually what happens is you know they are not really watching them too carefully and one of the cows just are wandering over into a Lakota camp. This particular group of Mormons are sort of scared of all American Indians, Lakota or anybody else, doesn't really matter. So rather than going in and saying, hey, that's my cow, I want it back and taking it, they get to the edge of camp, see the natives, get scared, turn around. And so the Lakota are sitting there and they see this random cow crossing their village. So there's one guy by the name of High Forehead, who was a relative of the three people who had been killed the prior year, decided to shoot the cow and eat it. The Mormon settlers, in the meantime, go to Fort Laramie, and they find a receptive ear with Lieutenant Fleming, the same guy, if you recall, who had led the, that initial minor conflict with the Lakota the previous year. The guy who had been made head leader of all Lakotas, conquering bear or scattering bear, however you want to translate that name, a road to Fort Laramie at the same time to try to talk to Lieutenant Fleming. He basically said, look, this thing happened, one of my men killed the cow that belonged to one of the settlers, I want to avoid all kind of trouble, so I'm going to pay you with horses. I'll give you a horse, I'll give you two horses, I'll give you blankets, I'll give you whatever you want, I just want to make these things go away, I don't want it to be the source of any trouble. But Fleming was apparently in a pretty bad mood, said, nope, I'm not going to accept payment for the cow. I need to arrest the guy who was guilty of killing the cow. So on August 19, one of Fleming's friends, another lieutenant by the name of John Gratton, was a recent West Point graduate who for weeks had been voicing his contempt for Indians. He he had been voicing this idea that he was with just a few men, he could beat all the late, uh, the Lakota around, that you know, no matter what the odds are, a white man will always prevail over an Indian. He had a bit of a racist uh, attitude toward the natives. And he was the man that kind of convinces Fleming to let him go, say, hey, pick me, let me go do the arrest. I want to go there and take care of business, you know. Gretten has clearly been waiting for a chance to flex his muscle and show what he's made of. So he grabs a few soldiers with him, specifically 29 soldiers will go with Gretten, plus one interpreter, um, part French, part uh, Iowa Indian guy, who was uh, famous around the fort for drinking himself out of his mind on a regular basis and he combined the fact that he was royally drunk at this moment with the fact that he hated the Lakota which are not really the best requirements in the guy you want to have with you translating in what likely will be very delicate negotiations in any case Gratton picks him takes him with him so he the interpreter and these 29 soldiers they head out of Fort Laramie his interpreter is so drunk that they have to literally lift him up and tie him up in a saddle to make him stand straight. They grab a couple of cannons and head to the Lakota village. I'm not sure whether they were aware of this or not, but this is a seriously momentous time in the history of the relation between the United States and the Lakota. One of the older Lakota leaders begged the soldiers, say, please don't do it, there are lots of my people over there, many of them are angry, there's potential for things to go wrong. But Gratton replied with his bravado, saying, I don't care how many of your people out there, I can whip all the Indians this side of the Missouri, I'm not really scared of them, so just get out of my way and let me do my job. 
so as Grattan and his soldiers are approaching the Lakota village, Crazy Horse and his little brother, Little Hawk, they are on a hill playing as they see the soldiers riding into camp. Crazy Horse, or rather, still named Curly at this time, is about 14 years old. His brother was probably about 7 years old, something like that. And uh, they are right there with the front seat to what's going to be the first battle between the Lakota and the United States. The soldiers enter the Lakota camp, and the camp is a big camp. There's probably well over 1,200 warriors, which means more than double that the population when you include the elders and women and children and everything else. It's probably... 3,000 plus people. And, I mean, you got to hand it to Gretta. The guy was brave, no doubt about it. You know, 30 soldiers entering a camp of some 3,000 people. You have to either really believe in yourself or you got to be crazy or a mix of both. Just to make sure that things will go wrong, the drunken interpreter immediately begins to insult the Lakota. He starts yelling at them, saying, I'm going to eat your heart row. I'm going to, you know, he starts telling them all the things that they are going to do to them, that they are cowards, that he's going to kill them all. You know, standard uh, aggressive drunken talk. Some of the Lakota leaders try to calm down Grattan, but the reply that he gave, supposedly, according to the sources here, I have come down here for them men, and I'll have him, or I will die. Well, as it turns out, his request will be fulfilled and he'll get exactly one of those options. Probably not the one he wanted, but definitely one of them. The Lakota leader conquering bear tries to convince High Forehead to give himself up, to let Grattan arrest him and take him away. And High Forehead say, yeah, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to surrender, sorry. Everybody understands that the odds are high, that things are going to go badly. So women and kids in the Lakota camp begin to move away from the camp itself as the warriors prepare for what likely may be a fight. In the meantime, I Forehead and some of his friends, they stand in a line and they make a big show of cleaning their guns, indicating we are ready when you guys are. It's kind of a showing off in front of the soldiers the fact that they were not backing down, they were not scared. Conquering Bear, in the meantime, is running back and forth between these two groups that seem very intent on shooting each other. He's trying to be the peacemaker, but on both sides he finds that neither side want to listen to him. Upon seeing uh, High Forehead and his friends cleaning their guns, Grattan orders his soldiers to form a skirmish line and fire. The soldiers though shoot first, dropping one of the men. Now, some of the older Lakota leaders are still scrambling. They scream, don't shoot, don't shoot, don't retaliate to their own people. It may end here, let it go. But now the soldiers shoot a second time. Uh, Conquering Bear realizes this is going nowhere, so he walks away from the conversation with Grattan. And at this point, when Grattan orders his soldiers to fire the cannon, Conquering Bear is wounded in this volley, and the other five Lakota are killed by the guns and the cannons. At this point, the Lakota warriors in camp decide they've had enough, and they will attack. In a matter of a few minutes, they close in on these 30 soldiers and kill them all. So the first battle between the U.S. Army and the Lakota began and ended very quickly, and it does not end in a way that the U.S. Army is happy with. Uh, this is in many ways a sign of things to come. You know, there will be places throughout North America where the U.S. will be able to steamroll through native tribes, where they will be able to take the land they want, crushing any kind of military resistance very easily. The Great Plains are not going to be one of those places, and this first incident is really just a sign of things to come. Now, after 
after killing all the soldiers, the interpreter and managed to hide. So he's the only guy who does not get killed. You know, he was drunk, but he wasn't stupid. So he had hit them in a, in a teepee that nobody was using. But apparently somebody saw him there. So the Lakota, extremely angry with him, they just go in, drag him out and cut off his tongue before killing him. So no survivors on the soldier side. And at this point, some of the warriors are even thinking, let's attack for Laramie. Let's just kill them all. Let's kill all the other soldiers as well. And Conquering Bear, despite being wounded, as well as some of the other leaders, order them, don't do it. You know, we may still be able to fix it. Yeah, we had one fight, but we don't want to get into a war with the United States. Don't attack. So that's the end of this one story. But anger in the Lakota camp is still running high. So a few warriors will start leading raids in various directions. In one occasion, just a couple of months later, they will attack a stagecoach that was carrying mail just a few miles away from the fort, killing the man on the stagecoach, taking well over $10,000 in uh, pay that was being sent at this time. One of the guys participating in this attack on the stagecoach, his spotted tail, was uh, the brother of uh, Curly's stepmoms at this time. And again, I mention his name because he's going to show up again in relation to this attack on the stagecoach. But for the time being, they did this. They attacked. There are a few isolated attacks against some of the American migrants crossing through. There's one instance in which three of them are killed. So the peace that had been existing between the Lakota and the United States is long gone by now. So here we have 30 U.S. soldiers laying dead and bloody in the middle of this Lakota camp. What about Crazy Horse? Crazy Horse had uh, you know, witnessed all of this, witnessed this fairly dramatic display of violence right in the middle of his village. The way Mary Sanders tells the story was that Crazy Horse got a bit freaked out by everything he saw and decided to go on a vision quest. Now, keep in mind there are disagreements about it. The other sources say that Mary Sanders makes it a little too simple and plays what will be multiple vision quest experiences that Crazy Horse will engage in. She kind of put it together, one big vision that happens immediately after this fight with Grattan. Others disagree. They say that there were multiple visions that happened at either times, but regardless. Well, first, let's, what are we talking about? What exactly is a vision quest? What is this thing that Crazy Horse will engage in, whether once or multiple times? What are we talking about? Well, think of the vision quest as the grandfather of all religious rituals. You know, if you're looking for one of the most ancient primordial religious ceremonies that you find across the globe that many many different cultures even cultures that were never in contact with each other practice one form or another of vision quest and that's because in some way it's in our dna you know the vision quest is one of those experiences that's it's even at the beginning of most modern religions you know the origins of it may be lost in time but the basics are very easy to understand, which is why it's so popular throughout the world. The vision quest basically boils down to isolation, you know, the person practicing going off on their own, away from everybody else, so as not to be distracted. So that's element number one. Element number two is fasting. You know, staying away from food. The digestion clearly, we well know scientifically that it takes a lot of the body energy, the kind of food you put in your body affects consciousness. Not having food in your body affects consciousness. So through fasting, you are kind of altering your body chemistry a little bit. And prayer. Those are the three elements that characterize vision quest. Isolation, fasting, prayer. And when you think about these three elements, think of some of the most famous figures in the history of religions even within those religious traditions that today don't practice anything resembling a vision quest, 
often you find the Vision Quester experience at the beginning of it all. Think Christianity, for example. You know, what do they say about the Jesus story? Right after being baptized, according to um, the Gospels, Jesus goes off in the desert for 40 days, fasting and praying. And after this experience, he starts going around and performing miracles and doing all, you know, starting his ministry. Which from a Lakota standpoint would make perfect sense. The Lakota would see this as the classic shamanic experience. Somebody who goes off for this super powerful vision quest, isolate themselves in the wilderness, fast and pray, and through this comes in contact with a spiritual essence they will grant him these seemingly superhuman powers. That's exactly what Lakota shamans are said to do. And again, I use the word shaman, which is not the most precise, but uh, please let it slide for now. There are, it's hard to find a single term that people agree on for this, but you know, the whole concept of going out there to make contact with a spiritual entity during this course and while this is happening, you'll go into this altered state of consciousness when you will have a vision that will either give you insight on some kind of problems you're struggling with, or it will grant you some concrete power. How to become a better healer, how to become a better warrior, how to become a better hunter, how to whatever that may be, some kind of power that you will gain through this vision. We see it with the Jesus story. Think about Buddhism. You know, the story of Buddha, how does he achieve enlightenment by isolating himself, going off into the forest, meditating under the body tree. So in his case, it's not prayer, it's meditation, but close enough, while fasting. So yet again, you have isolation, fasting, prayer slash meditation. And that's how Buddha achieves enlightenment. Think about Islam. The story goes that Muhammad, multiple times in his life, went off in a cave, so isolation from everybody, by himself in a cave, where he would fast and pray. And during one of these experiences that he starts hearing this voice, which will be the voice that will dictate to him the Quran, which is the foundation for Islam. So right there, Islam, Buddhism, Christianity, there's a vision quest experience at the beginning of it all. Uh, many stories regarding Jewish prophets are similar in this regard. Fasting, prayer, isolation, you know. This is really something that you find throughout the world. I, can, I really cannot think of a religious ceremony that's as important as, as widespread among so many cultures. Now, many cultures no longer engage in it today. The Lakota still do, and they definitely did during Crazy Horse time. Now, this vision business, you know, non-believers will say that you're just hallucinating. You're starving yourself and you start seeing things. Believers argue that you are peeling away layers of reality by going through this process. You're not distracted by other people's voices, by opinions, by food, by anything. And you are able to tap into a finer level of reality that allows you to come in contact with the spiritual essence of the universe. And depending on what it is that you believe in, you know, in some cultures that will mean spirits that you may contact to gain their help. In other cultures, it may be God. You know, the specific thing varies, but the common theme is that this is how you make contact with a power greater than yourself and you ask for help. So the story goes that Curly had his first vision quest experience either immediately after the Grattan's fight or perhaps up to a year later, but somewhere when he's still a young teenager, 14 years old, 15 years old, something like that. And in his vision, he saw a few beings. He saw a red-tailed hawk. This red-tailed hawk was one of his animals that will show up in his dreams and his iconography quite a bit. And he will also see what are referred to as the thunder beings. The thunder beings are spirits that the Lakota identify with lightning and rain. 
Now, receiving a vision from the Thunder Beings is tricky business. Because according to Lakota culture, that means that the person receiving this vision will have to become what they refer to as a Heyoka. What's a Heyoka? A Heyoka is somebody who had a dream of the vision of these Thunder Beings, and from this point forward, we left to... There's a double deal there. On one hand, they gain power. You gain one of the powers that are said to have is power over rain, and be able to bring rain and push rain clouds away. But also, it comes at a price. Heyokas will be required to act as... Uh, it's a concept that we don't really have an equivalent in Western culture, or at least maybe we do, but nothing that comes to my mind at this moment, because a heyoka is basically a sacred clown. Now, those are two words that we usually don't use together, sacred and clown. I mean, clown is this buffoonish figure that makes you laugh. Sacred is this serious, important thing. How do they go together? Well, Lakota culture doesn't really separate the two. A heyoka will be sacred in the sense that they have this spiritual power, but that they will act in these crazy, hilarious ways that break all social taboos, they break all the norms. You know, a heyoka will walk in the middle of a ceremony while everybody's all focused and somber. They will do all these crazy, outrageous things. They will mimic having sex with anything that moves in a one-mile radius. They will go around saying that they are, you know, taking off all their clothes and saying, oh, oh, it's so hot, I'm sweating in the middle of winter when snow is falling. They will do the opposite in summer where they cover themselves up, shivering, putting all these blankets when it's super hot outside. You know, in other words, they will act against all the accepted rules of behavior in ways that are completely hilarious and comical, making people laugh. And this is part of what a Heyoka has to do. You know, they sort of have to sacrifice their reputation and their sense of propriety for the sake of A, making people laugh, but B, being granted these powers that will go with the vision that they had. And this is exactly what, what happens to Crazy Horse. Now, being a Heyoka, people will do it in different ways. In some ways can be very dramatic, in some ways can be minor. You know, I'm, there are some people who maybe hey, okay, and all they do is just, you know, everybody goes into a ceremony, walking into the lodge clockwise, and they'll go counterclockwise. You know, he may be subtle, not very dramatic things, but in some cases it can be pretty intense kind of stuff. Now, childhood tragedy had already affected Curly big time. Add to this, he's becoming a Hayoka, something, you know, this guy really has no chance to be anything but weird in a lot of ways. Author Kingsley Bray writes that Crazy Horse becoming a Heyoka, I quote, shaped and heightened the gloomy reserve that characterized one aspect of his peacetime behavior. Heyoka both gave curly hair and accepted public guise for his melancholy, and more deeply hatched it into his inner being. So in other words, now he has an excuse for it. You know, his, his weirdness that characterized him already, now he has an official excuse for being so weird and different from everybody. But at the same time, taking on this institutional role will also make it even a stronger part of his personality. Crazy Horse will have other visions in his lifetime when he was still a young man. Again, the chronology is doubtful, we're not exactly sure, but Kingsley Bray referred to a second vision that possibly happened when he was 20 years old. And during this vision cast, he saw a man on horseback emerge out of the water of a lake and come out and talk to him. And among the messages that he received there was that he would never wear a war bonnet, you know, you know how you see the typical images of plain Indians with this big war bonnet covered in eagle feathers, that's something that 
a lot of people did and in some way the why did they do it well each eagle feather represented one coup that you counted so having a whole big war bonnet full of eagle feathers was basically showing off how much of a tough guy you were you know it's a way to advertise each one of these feathers is a brave act i've done in war and look how many of them i have at least that's one of the interpretations there are others as well but in his vision crazy horse is told don't do it you're not gonna wear one of these you are allowed to wear one feather that's it um you're gonna dress plainly nothing too flamboyant you are not to tie your horse's tail, which is something that most Lakota did when going into battle. And he receives instruction on what, in which way to paint his body when he goes to war. And part of his painting will involve uh, lightning and spots representing hail, which are tied to this notion of the thunder beings. He's also told to gather dust dug up from gopher holes, and cover himself with it and uh, you know all these other little specific things about basically ritual preparations before battle if he's gonna do all this the spirit promises him you're never gonna be killed in battle bullets are not gonna find you you're gonna walk out unscathed and you're gonna be okay and then after this vision you know crazy horse went into the lake came out and kind of felt reborn the interpretation they give is that the man, the spirit from the lake, was a water spirit, which is a different set of spirits that the Lakota people believed in that are sometimes rivals with the thunder beings. So the fact that Crazy Horse received the vision both from thunder beings as well as from water spirits is the idea that both of these powers would help him. And one of the things he's told in this vision, though, which turns out to be very prophetic if it's true, is that yes, he will be undefeatable in battle. Nobody will be able to touch him in battle. But he can and will be killed when his own people are holding him back. If his own people are holding him, then he'll be vulnerable to being stabbed. And that's how he may die. And as we're going to see, both elements of this story will turn out to be true. Both is being undefeatable in battle, as well as the stuff about when his own people are holding him back. But for now, let's forget for a second about the future that awaits Crazy Horse, and let's go back to where we left things off. In fact, we still have the little matter of the 30 US soldiers that were killed in battle with the Lakota, which clearly is not something that the United States is going to forget about anytime soon. Government is pretty upset about it, so they send a group, a much larger group of soldiers, about 600 soldiers, under the leadership of a man, he was a general, named William Harney. They send Harney with his 600 soldiers in 1855 to seek revenge. Harney was probably the right man for the job. He had fought against American Indian tribes multiple times already, in the Seminole Wars, and in Black Hawk War. He also brought to his job a certain aggressive streak. His biographers say that he had once beaten to death a female slave because she had lost his house keys, and he was not the kind of guy to forget about it. And as we're going to see, Hearn is going to bring this cheerful disposition to his encounter with the Lakota. The new government agent at Fort Laramie, had told those Lakotas who did not want to be part of any war to camp south of the North Platte River. One of these Lakota leaders who did not want to be engaged against the U.S. Army, a man by the name of Little Thunder, he did want peace, but he asked for one more buffalo hunt in the north. He figured, okay, we're going to do... The buffalo is still plentiful north of the North Platte River, so let us do this one hunt and then we'll camp south. Well, apparently nobody had informed Harney about it, or maybe if they did inform, he didn't care. So when Harney arrived at the North Platte, he noticed that this one camp was still north of the river and decided that they would be the guys to pay for the previous year's attack 
against US troops. Arnie gave uh, his pep talk to his soldiers. Basically was all about, these guys are the ones responsible for massacring the soldiers last year. They killed, uh, in his own words, he said, they killed your own kindred, your own flesh and blood. Don't spare any of them. So, you know, there's this, uh, everybody's worked up right now. Everybody's out for revenge. When his troops approach Little Thunder's camp, Little Thunder comes out of the camp. Harney moves toward him. They decide to sit down and negotiate and talk things out. So Little Thunder says, yeah, let's sit down and talk to clarify any misunderstanding. He offers to shake hands. Harney refuses to shake hands with him, but he said, I'll listen to what you have to say. The reality is this listen to what you have to say was actually a trick. He was just buying time for his soldiers so that they could get in position surrounding the village. And when everybody was ready, Harney could just quit the conversation with Little Thunder, give the signal and order the attack. That's exactly what his units did, and very quickly they ended up killing some 86 Lakota, about half of them women and kids, and they captured about 70 more women and children. In the words of a newspaper reporter that was with this uh, military expedition, I never saw a more beautiful thing in my whole life, which makes me think that this guy probably needed to get out more often. In any case, the Mary Sandals tells a story that Crazy Horse, uh, who is now a teenager, arrived after this fight, because he was not in this camp, he was in a different camp, but arrived onto the scene, helped save a Cheyenne woman who was camping with the Lakota, and goes on into lots of details, but the reality is that she probably made this story up. Just about there's not a single primary source to indicate that this happened. Nobody places Crazy Horse at the center of this action. What just about every other source seemed to indicate is that he was not there, but he was told about what happened by some of the survivors. And this definitely impacted him, but yet he was not physically present in this action. What happened too is that Harney and his soldiers took the captives back to Fort Laramie. And this is where the story, I mean, if it's not ugly already, it definitely gets ugly now, since his officers chose the prettiest women among the captives to rape, and then handed out the others for the soldiers to rape. So there was a hierarchy of rape, depending on the beauty of the captives. Harney, in the meantime, said that the war is going to continue unless those who were responsible for the attack on the stagecoach the previous year would be turned in. Otherwise, if these guys were not going to be turned in, he was going to hand out all the captives to the pony. The pony were tribal enemies of the Lakota, so the implication of Harney's threat was, I'm going to give your relatives out to the ponies so that they can torture and kill them. This does get the attention of the surviving Lakota, uh, one leader by the name of Iron Shell, whose mother, son, and three wives were among the captives, asked Spotted Tail to surrender. Spotted Tail, if you recall, was one of the men who had been responsible for the attack on the stagecoach the previous year. Spotted Tail himself had his wife and the infant daughter among those who were captured. So he agrees to, uh, he agrees to turn himself in. Unlike Crazy Horse, Spotted Tail was present during that battle, and he still carried several scars from the battle. He had two bullet wounds, gashes from the sabers from the soldiers, so he had been in the midst of the action. Now, he and a couple of his friends surrender, saying, we are the guys who attack the stagecoach. You ask for us, here we are. They very much believed that they were going to be hung, so when they show up there, they are singing their death songs in preparation when they arrive at Fort Laramie. But they are not going to get hanged. Instead, they get sent to prison to Fort Leavenworth. And eventually, after a little over a year, the president decided to, as a goodwill gesture, to pardon Spotted Tail and the other two guys. The year in prison, or year and whatever many months in prison, did affect Spotted Tail big time. Prior to this incident, he had been one of the more aggressive Lakota leaders, renowned as a warrior and everything else. 
after the presidential pardon, when he returns among his own people, he will become a voice for peace. He'll regularly kind of abandon the warpath against the Americans and become a voice for peace. One of the legacies of this 1855 Harney expedition was that it ignited further rounds of intertribal warfare between the Lakota on one side and particularly the Crows on the other. Other tribes as well, but particularly Lakota and Crows. Why is that? What's the connection? Well, it's simple, really. Having seen what happened to some of their relatives, many Lakota decide that it's probably a good idea to try to scamp as far away from Americans as possible. So what does that mean? It means that they have to push west into the lands of other tribes, particularly the Crows. So starting from 1856 forward, Lakota and Crows will get into some very intense intertribal warfare. Uh, this is a conflict that the Lakota will mostly win, and they will start chasing the Crows out of their hunting ground, and the Lakota will gain them as a result of this series of battles. This increase in intertribal warfare will affect Crazy Horse directly. He was coming to be of the age where it was expected for a Lakota male to uh, become a warrior and start participating in these raids. He joins his first war party, uh, in this case against the Pony. So they attack at this place in Nebraska, uh, this uh, Pony village. The Lakota charge the village. Uh, pony women and kids were running around the cornfields trying to get back into the safety of the village. Crazy Horse was among the first to charge the enemy. There's really not much more than that in the story. You know, there's no big killing, no heroic act, nothing that we get to find out about what happened in this, other than the fact that Crazy Horse was beginning to join war parties from this point forward. Here, however, is where the story gets a little weird. There are a couple of sources, specifically Mary Sanders, and at the same time also Joseph Marshall, who is a Lakota author who wrote a biography of Crazy Horse. They both tell that Crazy Horse got into a battle against the Omaha tribe, and that uh, he shot an enemy, and only afterwards, when he went to see the body, he realized that he was a young woman, and he kind of freaked out, felt very bad about it, and, well... The fact is, there's not a whole lot of evidence to support this. You know, in the Mary Sanders interviews, it doesn't show up. So it may be something that was made up, that is not correct. But what this does, what is related to, rather, what is uh, maybe connected to, is the fact that he dog, one of Crazy Horse's friends, tells that around this time, after a war party, Crazy Horse killed a woman. Now... He dog doesn't really explain what happens. It's sort of left up in this big mystery without really clarifying what's going on. So the reality is it's possible that Mary Sandals made up uh, a narrative to fit this crazy horse killing of a woman in a way that was um, maybe a little more palatable than re the reality. The fact is we don't know, so it's useless to speculate. It's a possibly disturbing incident, but again, we know so little about it that I'll just throw it out there and leave it as is, since there's no way to know anything any further. In 1857, the Lakota bands decided to gather together in all the many, many, many Lakota villages spread throughout the prairies. They send messengers to everybody so that everybody will gather together at one place at Burbute, which is in the this large mountains at the very northern edge of the Black Hills of South Dakota. Beautiful place, by the way. It's still the place where, to this day, they have a biker rally, where uh, bikers from all across the United States gather together in Sturgis, which is right next to Burbut, during the summer. I remember once going out there, and it um, was awesome. You know, I climbed up the mountain, went up all the way to Burbut. I remember seeing this elderly biker couple going up to pray so that the biker rally would be peaceful, which I thought was a really cute, strange moment, seeing these big, tough bikers covered in tattoos going up there to pray on this mountain that's considered sacred by the Lakota Cheyenne and a few other tribes so that there would be no violence during the rally. In any case, back to our story. Uh, what is that the Lakota do at Burbute in 1857? 
they set up the largest tribal council in Lakota history. The vast majority of Lakota attended. Here we got many of the key characters that will play a role in the conflict in the United States in the years to come. Sitting Bull, Red Cloud, Crazy Horse himself, while stealing his things, he's there and participate. And after much talking, what the Lakotas agree on is that they will try to stay away from attacking American settlers traveling through, but they will fight the military if they try to get into their lands. And not only that, but since they know that any news of gold would attract thousands and thousands of Americans, and they know that there is gold in the Black Hills, which is not only part of their homeland, but is part of their homeland that they consider sacred, that is central to their religious practice, they pass a resolution that anybody will reveal the existence of gold in the Black Hills to the Americans will be killed. So that's, these are some of the conclusions that this council led to. The emphasis here is on protecting Lakota land, the Black Hills in particular. Shortly after the end of the council, Crazy Horse's mentor, High Backbone, decided to lead a war party against some tribal enemies. They ran into a different tribe. There's a little bit of debate about which tribe that may have been, but a detail, really. In the course of the action, High Backbone's horse was shot and he fell to the ground and the enemies were charging trying to get to him. Arrows were flying all over all around but Crazy Horse charged in the middle of the enemy to kind of scoop up High Backbone, load him up on his own horse so that he could take him back to the Lakota lines and save him in this fashion. After saving High Backbone, Crazy Horse turned his horse around and charged against several enemies knocking quite a few of them off their horses, and by the time he made his way back to the Lakota lines, he came back with two scalps that he had taken from killing and scalping two of the enemies. He also comes back wounded, one of the rare times when Crazy Horse is wounded in battle, something that doesn't happen very often, but it did happen in this case. Once this is done, they decide to call it a day, was, there was enough bravery and action for one day, and they go back home. By the time they go back home, Crazy Horse is beginning to make a name for himself. You know, having saved such an amazing warrior as High Backbone during the course of the fighting is something that catches the attention of a lot of other Lakota. Plus, he accounted several coups during the course of this fight. So, Crazy Horse's father, the elder Crazy Horse, decided to host a giveaway for his son. You know, they give Crazy Horse uh, a red eagle plume, which is in Lakota symbology, that was, uh, it's kind of the equivalent of a, of a purple heart for modern day veterans. You know, once you are wounded, you get the right to wear this purple heart. It's uh, among the Lakotas, you would get the right to wear this red eagle plume. And he also gained the right to wear uh, one eagle feather for each coup he had counted, which apparently there were five of them. So, you know, it was a big event. He had fought very well in this battle. His parents staged this big giveaway, and as part of the giveaway, the elder Crazy Horse gave his son, whom I keep calling Crazy Horse, he wasn't yet Crazy Horse yet, he'll finally become Crazy Horse in this case, because the elder Crazy Horse gave his son the name Crazy Horse, and he takes for himself a different name, uh, Waglula in Lakota, which is translated as Warm. So this is how the teenage Curly got the name Crazy Horse. It translated in from the Lakota, uh, the name Crazy Horse is Tashunka Witko. Witko is crazy, Tashunka is horse. There's a different story that some of Crazy Horse's descendants tell about how he got the name. It's still a war story, it's still about, in this case, a Shoshone war party attacking the Lakota camp, Crazy Horse uh, avenging a woman that had just been, been killed in front of him. Uh, by killing some of the enemies attacking the village. And again, they have a big giveaway, and, uh, and the elder Crazy Horse give his son the name Crazy Horse. We don't know exactly for sure which one he was, but some kind of big heroic uh, fight while he was either 17 or 18 years old, uh, leading up to him acquiring the, uh, the name 
that it will make him famous. From this point forward, this point being about 1858, despite the fact that Crazy Horse was not the most sociable guy around, lots of people started following him, started acknowledging his leadership in warfare. It's particularly many young guys figured that he was one of the most prominent warriors of their generation and so they would follow him in battle. Uh, one of his friends, a guy by the name of He Dog, says this about Crazy Horse's strategic approach to fighting. He didn't like to start a battle unless he had it all planned out in his head and knew he was going to win. Hard to blame a guy for good strategy. Another thing that made him uh, an attractive leader is the fact that he would often kill enemies, but then he didn't count coup on that. What does that mean? Well, killing an enemy did not count coup in the system that um, popular among the plain tribes that honored bravery. Counting coup was after either the enemy may be alive or if after he's dead, whoever got to touch him first count coups. Why is that important? Because there means they are really close to the action. Again, somebody can be 100 yards away and shoot an enemy dead, but who's going to be the one who's right next by the body of the enemy, which means very close to the enemy lines. And the Lakota honored that, and so they say that in some cases Crazy Horse would kill an enemy, but he would refuse to count coup, letting instead some of the younger warriors win war honors in this way. So the number of raids he participated in increases dramatically around this time. In one particular occasion, during a fight with the Shoshone tribe, he's uh, wounded. Again, I just said that it's rare for Crazy Horse to get wounded, and now we have two in a row. I swear from this point forward, where it doesn't really happen much more. But he was wounded in the calf, and his horse was shot down. So he kind of found himself on foot, the rest of the Lakota had been uh, kind of running away from this counter charge by the Shoshone. No one is coming to rescue him. He's right there kind of as an easy target. One Shoshone warrior was ahead of the rest and decided to kind of charge down Crazy Horse. Rather than running away, which would have been a suicidal strategy anyway, since, you know, you're on foot and the other guy's on a horse. Crazy Horse turned around and charged the enemy, jumping onto the, the horse unhorsing the enemy warrior, killing him, stealing his horse, and making his way back to the Lakota lines. In another occasion, a couple of years later, uh, he's going to lead a big war party of Lakota and Cheyenne against uh, a Crow camp in southern Montana. The story goes that he makes it almost inside the camp, and he starts fighting some of the crows defending their village right at the edge of camp. During the course of the fighting, he jumps off his horse, kills an enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and scalps him right there within a few steps from the crow teepees. The crows at this point reorganize, they give chase, Lakota and Cheyenne run away, and again Crazy Horse demonstrates his bravery by kind of holding the rear guard. He will be, he let the other Lakota escape while he holds back some of the crows by killing some of them and convincing the others that maybe they don't want to follow so closely when there's such a tough warrior uh, watching the back of the Lakota column. In this way he's gaining a great reputation for bravery to the point that some of the some of the crows themselves acknowledge him as this amazing warrior. Clearly, they weren't too happy with him since he was making his fame by killing their people, but they did admire the bravery. There's a story about one crow warrior saying, I'm going to quote his words, We know Crazy Horse better than we know you, other Sioux. Whenever we have a fight, he's closer to us than he is to you. That's... A pretty that's quite a compliment right there you know in the middle of the fight he's always closer to the enemy than he is to his own lines the guy is either really confident in his skills or borderline suicidal or a mix of both but in either case he seems to always come out unskated from many of these fights now there's a controversial story that mary sandos and joseph marshall report on but others disagree with so I'll, I'll tell it to you regardless, and then we'll see what the evidence is. Story goes that during yet another raid against the Shoshone, 
when a whole group of Lakota are leaving camp, heading for uh, Shoshone village. One of the Lakota warriors, a man by the name of No Water, decide, I'm not feeling so good, my teeth are hurting, um, uh, it's a bad idea for me to be part of this fight, I'm just gonna go back to the village. And why is this important? Because in the meantime, in the months prior to this, Crazy Horse had been flirting with a young Lakota woman named Black Buffalo Woman, who was a king from a very important family. She was the niece of the renowned war leader Red Cloud. So what does this have to do with the Shoshone, no water, claiming a two-take and backing out of the fight and all of that? Well, the story goes that by the time Crazy Horse come back with the rest of the warriors from this raid against the Shoshone, he finds out that Black Buffalo Woman's family had given her away in marriage to no water. Crazy Horse does not take it well. He's heartbroken over this and he decided to console himself by going on more war parties to stay away from the camp and not be reminded about what just happened. This is the story as reported by Mary Sanders and Joseph Marshall. Others argue that there really are no primary sources backing the story up. Uh, it's debated whether it, ha it happened exactly like this or not. We do know for sure that Black Buffalo Woman did marry No Water, and this is actually going to be a very important story that will come up later in Crazy Horse's life. But for the time being, let's leave it as is, since we really don't know whether this is legend or truth. Uh, there's certainly an element of truth to it, but we don't know if it really happened the way Mary Sanders tells. In any case, regardless of the details of this particular story, something that was happening on a larger scale, many Lakota were beginning to depend on white Americans. Some of them finding the number of buffaloes dwindling every year began depending on the government supplies, the ones that had been promised to the Lakota in exchange for letting American travelers go through their land. Whereas some bands were still very much independent, very much living the old lifestyle, Others were growing increasingly dependent on the government supplies. And this created quite a bit of tension among the Lakota, the ones who were still living the old life and the ones who were not. Aside from what's going on with the Lakota, it is something else that happened around this period of time that will have a huge impact on life on the Great Plains. In 1858, in what will become eventually the state of Colorado. Gold had been discovered, and this had attracted thousands of people to the area. Um, this signaled the birth of Denver as a town. This also signaled the beginning of serious conflict between some of the local tribes, specifically the Cheyenne and the Arapaho, and uh, the settlers. Now, it didn't have to be that way. Early on, things ran smoothly for a little bit. The initial contacts were friendly. There were even occasional intermarriages between Cheyenne and the Arapaho women and some of the settlers. But over time, the situation was bound to get ugly. It's hard to be surprised in some way. Here you have more and more American settlers coming in, wanting more and more of this land that the Cheyenne and the Arapaho are claiming for themselves. It's inevitable that something's got to give, you know. Once the Cheyenne and Arapa will start retaliating, the settlers will consider them thieves since they are stealing from them, but by the same token, the Cheyenne and Arapa also the settlers as thieves since they were taking their lands. So it was already a very delicate situation, and it's made worse by the fact that as time goes by, there's increased the separation between the tribes and the settlers and growing numbers of American citizens in this area begin to look down on their compatriots who are friendly with the natives, which is a recipe for disaster because in this very delicate situation, they end up shunning the very men who could mediate this uh, potentially explosive scenario. Not all Cheyenne and Arapaos responded the same way when faced with these attempts at grabbing more and more of their land. 
Some of them were willing to, in the name of keeping the peace and avoid fighting, were willing to give up progressively more and more land. For example, there was one Cheyenne leader by the name of Black Kettle who was among the peace faction. He was one of the Cheyenne who was saying, eh, you know, what are we going to do? We can't get into a war with these guys. I'm okay. And so he was willing to sign treaties, giving up the right to some of their lands. There were others, on the other hand, who were not quite so accommodating at all. In particular, there was a warrior society known as the Dog Soldiers among the Cheyenne, where among the more militant ones who wanted to hold on to the land and look down on those, on those chiefs who were willing to sell. Governor John Evans was quite upset with the resistance that the Dog Soldiers showed him. He wanted Colorado to become a state, and he wanted, to, he wanted himself to become its first senator. And the way he saw it, the Cheyenne just stood in the way, and something had to be done about it. Well, he found an ally in, uh, in a man by the name of John Chivington. Chivington was a former Methodist preacher who had, uh, during the Civil War, he had been raising this Colorado militia and had beaten Confederate troops in 1862 in New Mexico. He was a giant of a man, 6'5 tall, 260 pounds. And Chivington, much like Evans, understood that the quickest way to win in political office was by going against Indians. There was the, in those frontier states, hating Indians was a very popular sport. This was made even more popular when the Cheyenne retaliated with acts of violence. For example, in one instance, a group of dog soldiers attack some wagon trains carrying settlers to Colorado and even killing a family within just a few miles out of Denver. So the newspapers went crazy with this. They started making fun of the militia for not being active enough and kind of reproaching them for this. Uh, the Rocky Mountain News, which was one of the main newspapers in Colorado at this time, wrote, and I quote, A few months of active extermination against the Red Devils. This is what the Rocky Mountain News was asking for. Again, check out the language. A few months of active extermination against the Red Devils. That gives you an idea of how intense the whole thing was around the turn of the 1860s in Colorado. So Governor Evans told those Cheyenne who were for peace to separate themselves from the hostiles so he could tell who was who and there would be no mistakes. So there were a couple of these uh, Cheyenne chiefs, for example, Black, the Black Cattle that I just mentioned, another one named White Antelope. They traveled to Denver and asked the governor, hey, we want peace, can you do something to make sure? So the governor gave them an American flag a white flag, the idea being they could put them up on their teepees so that if American soldiers ran into a Cheyenne camp and they saw those flags flying on top of the teepees, they would know that these were friendly Indians and they would not attack them. Well, that was the idea at least, but that's not the way it's going to pan out. So in one case, John Chivington was leading the Colorado militia, decide to uh, go out hunting against some che Cheyenne and he happens to stumble on Black Kettle's camp in 1864. Many of the Cheyenne warriors are out hunting so the majority of the people in the camp are women, kids, elders and they're all freaking out when they see armed men, these columns of armed men in the hills surrounding them. Black Kettle tries to reassure his people, say, don't worry, don't worry, look, I'm going to wave uh, our American flag, our white flag, they are going to recognize that we're friendly and they're going to leave us alone, you know, this must be a mistake or something. But John Chivington was not the kind of guy who was for, was not a big fan of subtlety. To him, peaceful Indian, hostile Indian, there was no such things. In his mind, all Indians were equally deserving of death. So, Oh, just because you have an American flag up on your teepee, that doesn't mean much to Chivington. And it's also possible that Chivington perhaps was happy to find the Black Cattle's camp, because had he found the Dog Soldier camp, he would have been in for a fight. Things may have not been too easy for him, and 
he or maybe some of his men would have found themselves without a scalp in a matter of minutes. Black Kettle's camp, on the other hand, since they were not ready for war, made for an easy target. One of the men who were with Chivington, a man by the name of Silas Soul, protested. He said, we can't attack these guys, they are peaceful. You know, they are, they are a bunch of women and kids, we, we can't do that. But Chiviton replied, saying, I quote, I have come to kill Indians, and believe it is right and honorable to use any means under God's heavens to kill Indians. Damn any man who is in sympathy with an Indian. So that delivers the message quite clearly. So on November 29, 1864, Chivington's forces attack Black Kettle's camp. When the attack begins, Saul refuses to follow orders and he does not want to tell the men who are serving under him to fire because he said there were a bunch of women and kids who are coming forward essentially asking for mercy. Again, I quote from Saul's words, I refused to fire and swore that none but a coward would, for by this time hundreds of women and children were coming toward us and getting on their knees for mercy. Most of the other officers, however, did not see things the way he did, and they started screaming, kill the sons of bitches, and started saying that anybody who sympathized with Indians would be shot as well. So if you're not shooting the Indians, you need to be shot. So at this point, Chivington's forces just start unleashing hell on the Cheyenne camp. All in all, Chivington is going to lose about 10 men during this, you can't really call it a battle since one side is armed and ready to fight and the other one isn't and is mostly made of women and kids. But, and it, the, the body count will tell the story, you know, the 10 men dying on Chivington's side are little compared to 200 plus who are killed uh, among the Cheyenne, vast majority of them being women and kids. In the words of this interpreter by the name of John Smith, who was serving under Chivington, all manner of depredations were inflicted on their persons. They were scalped, their brains knocked out, the men used their knives, ripped open women, clubbed little children, knocked them in the head with their guns, beat their brains out, mutilated their bodies in every sense of the word. As massacres go, this is a particularly ugly one. The Colorado militia will return from the fighting with this victory parade through the streets of Denver as everybody is waving around, severe the limbs and Indian body parts that have been chopped off during the battle. Uh, many of the men had uh, decided to... Scalping got boring after a while, so they decided that to spice things up, they would scalp the pubic hair of Cheyenne women and use those in the victory parade, and uh, this was received quite well in Denver. In the words of the Rocky Mountain News, Colorado soldiers have again covered themselves with glory. Big victory parade, cheers in the theaters when uh, scalps were showed. The whole thing was, well, let's put it this way. People in Denver and uh, right there in Colorado did not exactly respond the same way as people who were a little further removed from the action did. Um, there was a representative in Congress said, uh, de described uh, what became known as the Sun Creek Massacre, that's the name of this, uh, again, I can't call it battle since it wasn't a battle, but um, this uh, engagement is the Sun Creek Massacre of 1864. Well, this one congressman described it as barbarity of the most revolting character. Such, it is to be hoped, as never before disgraced the acts of men claiming to be civilized. Even General Harney, remember the guy who massacred the Lakota in 1855 and was known for beating to death his own female servants who lost his house keys? The Sun Creek Massacre shocked even him, which tells you quite a lot about the massacre itself. He had spoken of Black Kettle as as good a friend of the United States as I am, and yet clearly being a good friend of the United States has not really protected him or his people from this brutal massacre. The military investigation that followed found Chivington guilty of the massacre, 
but by the time the verdict was announced, the terms of service for Chivinton and his men had expired, so they were no longer under military jurisdiction. Saul testified against Ch uh, Chivington and against some of the other men, but because of his uh, role in testifying and saying this is what happened, these are the atrocities that were committed and so on, about a month later he was killed by a Colorado volunteer who promptly escaped to California and avoided getting busted for murder. The Sand Creek Massacre is a momentous event in the history of the conflict between American Indians and the United States on the Great Plains. Sand Creek paradoxically made conditions much less safe for American citizens on the frontier. Because as a result of the Sand Creek Massacre, all of the Cheyenne peace leaders, the ones who had been advocating or working with the United States, lost influence among their own people. You know, clearly some of their own people would say, you still want to have peace? Did you see what they have done? What are you talking about peace? There is no peace. Black Kettle was for peace. Go ask him how that went for him. So as a result of this, the war faction among the tribes grew in strength. Following Sun Creeks, some of the survivors who had seen their family members chopped to pieces in front of them went to visit some of the other Cheyenne camps and went to the Lakota. And Cheyenne and Lakota decide to build this alliance as the survivors beg them for vengeance. They say, we cannot let this go unavenged. We cannot let these people get away with it. Please avenge us. Please strike a blow that they will remember. And their speech apparently hits the right note because most of the Lakota and Cheyenne will decide to do just that. So the years to come are going to be quite bloody on the frontier and things are not going quite so well for Americans on the Great Plains. We are